The newly instated science initiative has thus far had a rough start, but a drive to progress never once has faltered. With the second chance given to N9SA by the daring Spud mission, more mature and capable crewed flight development is well underway. Though flights are not predicted to take place until 1972, possibly 1971 if things progress quickly. This program's overall goal will be to land a Kerbal on the moon before 1975, and then greatly expand Kerbal's presence in low Earth orbit and beyond. But before N9SA is able to dig deep into space exploration and habitation, it must first break the skin, and current progress is realistically only skimming the surface of what is possible. Possibilities are merely a spark. The goal is an inferno. With crewed flight a long ways away, the exploration of near-Earth space begins with small satellites and probes. Basking Shark's goal will be to reside in low lunar orbit, collecting as much scientific data as possible. Unfortunately, during launch, an engine fails on the Raven 5, almost causing the mission's demise not even three minutes into the flight. The vehicle wildly spins, though propellant flow remains entirely stable as the opposing engine to the one that failed is shut down to re-establish some form of control. Through some miracle, the vehicle appears to be orienting itself towards the correct attitude once again, though a very rapid rotation still exists. This fact alone makes the staging separation of the four boosters a frightening event. Surprisingly, separation occurs cleanly and Basking Shark 1 continues on its way into orbit. Reaction control thrusters on the upper stage are utilized earlier than intended in an attempt to cancel out said rotation, and appear to be doing this successfully. Due to the inefficient maneuver of wildly spinning end over end during ascent, the lunar transfer capture stage will have to be utilized for the final push into orbit of the Earth as well. The Basking Shark 1 mission will intend to reach an inclined orbit of the Moon. On board are two additional TIE satellites to be deployed in said orbit, uh, although higher than the actual Basking Shark, whereas it will descend much lower than the two. A translunar injection is planned and executed with ease. Upon reaching Paraloon, the transfer stage's third burn is executed to both capture into an elliptical orbit and further increase said orbit's inclination. Basking Shark is detached from the transfer stage, and both spacecraft orient their solar panels towards the sun, awaiting the right time for final velocity adjustment. At Apolloon, the transfer stage makes its final burn to circularize its orbit before deploying TIESAT-7. The onboard orbital perturbation experiment would henceforth run suboptimally. Despite meeting the required orbital inclination for the experiment to run, faulty systems indicate this is not true and cause the experiment not to run unless being watched very closely. And 9 sa scientists scratch their heads, wondering if the engineers made a goof, or if they were witnessing some strange quantum physics event. Though less than ideal, definitely fascinating. Half an orbit later, Basking Shark begins to circularize its orbit at Paraloon. It will circularize over the course of several orbits, at which point a third burn is planned to increase the satellite's inclination even more since excess fuel on board is more than adequate to do so. This burn, however, was planned to take place on the far side of the moon with no direct communication with ground stations on Earth. There was no clear reason for this, other than the appetizing prospect of bouncing signal off a TISAT back to Earth to perform the maneuver, as this would be the first instance the program performed such a feat. All was going swimmingly until connection was abruptly cut, 
likely due to the increasing inclination and high speed of Basking Shark relative to the satellite it had been using to communicate with Earth. With no way to shut the engine down, Basking Shark burned through the entirety of its fuel, not only used for velocity adjustment, but also for attitude control. Essentially, the satellite is now rendered uncontrollable, with its solar panels pointed away from the sun and no way to reorient them. Science collection is likely still possible, though now on a very short duration basis rather than becoming a semi-permanent usable satellite in lunar orbit. Shifting attention back to the transfer stage, TiSat-8 is successfully deployed, though it is equipped with the same trouble regarding the onboard experiment. Still, both TiSats will further connection possibilities on the far side of the moon, something which is clearly lacking. Determined to see mission objectives succeed, N9SA launches Basking Shark 2 soon after the first. Another Raven 5 launch vehicle soars into the atmosphere above Cape Canaveral and is on its way to orbit. Two and a half minutes into flight, one of the four booster engines fail, hurling the vehicle into spinning end over end once again. This time, however, the opposing engine is not able to be shut down in the fray, and the mission is lost in a fiery disassembly. No further Basking Shark missions have been planned to this day. With little to no luck sending missions to the moon, Interest instead turns towards exploring even further into the solar system, under the philosophy that if one is to fail at something small and learn little, then it must be better to instead fail at something big and learn much, much more. Now, I'm not saying hope was non-existent for the following mission, but from a realistic point of view, success was understood as a 50-50 chance, and that is exactly why a backup for the mission was built. Two chances, both sides of the coin. One would have to succeed, right? The mission in question is called Flytrap. In 1967, three years before, a Raven 4 launched its final stage as a probe to fly past the planet of Venus, ever so slightly dipping its toes into the upper atmosphere, coinciding with established hypotheses utilizing various experiments on board that Venus's atmosphere is much more dense than our own. This knowledge led directly to planning a Venus lander which could utilize the atmosphere to slow its escape velocity to a halt and simply float down to whatever surface awaits beneath its clouds. Concerning the aforementioned 50-50 chance for success, Flytrap 1's UHF communication system failed just shy of reaching orbit of the Earth. With a perigee of negative 60 kilometers and no form of control whatsoever, all N9SA can do is wait for the spacecraft's inevitable disintegration via Earth's atmosphere in roughly an hour's time. Flytrap 2 has no problems reaching low Earth orbit and establishes connection with ground control successfully, planning its next maneuver towards Venus. In 121 days, Flytrap will detach from its transfer stage and aerobrake in the atmosphere of Venus. Here's hoping. In the meantime, a brand new launch vehicle called the MXL is ready for its debut flight. This vehicle greatly surpasses the Raven 5 in lifting capability, though not initially meant to replace it. On board this flight is a lunar lander called Poseidon. Its primary mission is to collect a small sample of the lunar surface and transport it back to the Earth. Definitely an ambitious goal for a space program with such a low success rate, but it certainly held the attention of the press and could possibly open up doorways to more funding in the future. That is, until the vehicle begins to lose control upon reaching maximum dynamic pressure during ascent. Computing software in onboard avionics are identical to that used on every vehicle N9SA has in its arsenal but none before the MXL are nearly as powerful, and Max-Q coupled with a slight sway back and forth bring the Poseidon mission to an abrupt halt 16 kilometers into the sky. An identical mission is planned for and will launch early on in 1971. 
With the addition of a much more capable launch vehicle, should it succeed in the future, the Raven 5's termination is highly considered, due to both having far less capacity to low Earth orbit and its very high rate of failure. One mission is planned, given as an ultimatum from N9SA to its Raven program. Succeed on all accounts today, and Raven 5 will remain part of the space program. One can only imagine the looks mission planners got from launch directors when the vehicle performed an unplanned 270 degree rotation directly off the launch pad. Nevertheless, Raven 5 continues on its way in the correct heading. Its payload today is a series of small satellites meant to establish an array of communication dishes in lunar orbit. Apart from the payload fairing catching fire and exploding, likely breaking one or more satellites on board, the mission appears to be going nominally. That is, until moments later, several more explosions are seen, and the vehicle shatters into a mess of fire and debris just above the Carmen line. The Raven 5 program is promptly shut down, leaving all future missions to the MXL and MXL variants yet to be developed. But if I've got to be honest, at least Raven 5 went out with some flair. 121 days have now passed, and Flytrap 2 is approaching Venus. Connection is expected to be blocked by the surface upon close approach, so a KOS computer program will orient the lander for atmospheric re-entry and separate from the transfer stage at the appropriate time. Entry into the Venusian atmosphere at escape velocity involves a lot of guesswork since such a feat has never been attempted until now. N9SA chooses to go ahead with the planned parasite of 55 kilometers. Only time will tell how effective this will prove to be. Connection to Flytrap is lost, and it's all up to computer systems now. Should the mission succeed, N9SA will have no way of knowing for possibly months. One day on Venus is roughly 116 days on Earth, and the probe will be landing on the relative far side of the planet. But sadly, N9SA will never receive that weak radio signal from Venus, and the silence is deafening. <laughs> 